Oh god. (laughs) 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 No. (laughs) I had some ad come up. Oh my goodness. I mean, that's my latest track. You like that? That's what I've been working on. Some club movie, club music. Which one was it? It was mine. I turned it off now. Okay. I mean that no, that was my new tracks. Do you like the direction <laughs> I'm going? It sounded very um, sounded very new to me. Oh yeah. New direction. Uh, oh yeah. It reminded me of a telephone call from Kraftwerk. <laughs> yeah, I've been working hard. <laughs> So, um, how are you? Colleen. I'm great. <laughs> Very good. Okay. How are you all doing? Good. good. Yeah. Really good. Okay. I see some strange stuff emitting from Tony's head. What's? Um, can you explain what's going on? Uh, I I took some mushrooms about an hour ago, and <laughs> something something weird's happening. <laughs> Okay, hang hang in there, man. <laughs> I'll be I'll be all right. You uh, we'll we'll get through this together. <laughs> you have yeah, to we, write we me down. The, <laughs> What's you that? Write me down the color scheme because I don't I miss that color scheme. I don't have that one but that you use for your lamp. Oh yeah, you get different. You get different oil oil wheels. I have four, but not that one. I think this and is I the like one the that colors. came with it. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll I'll let I'll I'll let you know what it is <laughs> after. <laughs> it's a special um, kind of Something mushroom. Different. I see. Yeah. <laughs> a very colorful one. I see some uh, friends showing up already. Uh, let's say hi to John. John. Oh, hey, John. Hey. <laughs> And uh, Robin, hey, hey Robin. Um, Hi, so yeah, good I'm to see everybody, chat. and also the um, the people in um, who are always here, the the stream punks, and uh, all the people who are um, um, here uh, from the Discord server. So I'm see I see a lot of uh, familiar names showing up. Um, yeah, before the before the in the pre-show or whatever it's called, we were talking about. Um, everybody's live sessions and, and live things. Um, uh, I actually didn't know, but when Steve played um, um, live here in the studio, when, when we did Stay Home Sound System, um, I talked to him uh, <laughs> and um, uh, like, I don't know, maybe a month before, was it a month before? See, yeah, when I something like this. Yeah. And you re- you replied, yeah, sure, I'll, uh, I'll I'll come over and we'll do something. And you were already talking about gear, you stuff you want to use and stuff like that, you know. And then only uh, maybe in the week leading up to the date, um, you told me you'd never done that. <laughs> 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 I was like, I, I I must say, you know, for for that, um, um, you know, doing such a thing r- straight on air and. Um, without any experience it was a very ballsy move of you so and i am um, so yeah it was it was uh, it worked out great yeah yeah but then again i was in good hands i mean you're you're the one with the the longest uh, experience uh, i guess here in the netherlands in this part so i just have to follow the lead <laughs> sort of. yeah I, I i actually you know didn't play live uh, that much um 
in recent years but you know because of the stay home sound system thing it uh, became a thing again and um yeah. Yeah, and, and I really enjoyed it. It was really a lot of fun. Um, so by the time you showed up, I, that was already number, I think, 18? Hmm. Yeah, number the, 18. The second last or something? Yeah, the second last one, yeah. And uh, so by the time I had the, the hang of it. But um, but as with every live set, you know, there's always feeding back between the two performers, you know. There's always something um, uh, you add to each other's thing, yeah. you know. So, so it's definitely... A collaboration even though it was yeah. uh, even though it was the first time for you it was great yeah. really great yeah i learned a lot i have to say and, and also for me what 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 would be the perfect or almost perfect setup or what to bring and what's useful and what's not and like i said i had this big mixer that you put uh, left there for from luke slater the 24 track mm. and i think i had about 12 tracks of drums and that was not clever because i was totally confused <laughs> I, bar I barely used them i had the 808 and i had the tt78 and i had like i said 12 channels connected and actually i also didn't write on them uh -oh. there was only one <clears throat> channel that I probably looks later wrote clap so that's where i put the clap <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only thing and the rest yeah i was i was completely lost drum wise so <laughs> for next time i know it's just either one drum machine or none because i notice also i, I like sounds better also than than drums in a way yeah i mean splitting yeah. splitting too many things out is probably confusing when you, oh, it was you need totally. to be quick with things it's um yeah it's difficult to keep your head around it especially if, yeah. if the setup is something you haven't used before you know if if you, yeah. if you have like your weekly sort of touring routine you know where everything is and you can be a bit more um, um all over the place with your channels and stuff but if if it's a, a one-off thing it's it's easier to keep it uh, simple keep it simple <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's my motto Absolutely. normally keep it simple how many how many percent stupider oh. are you when you perform Colin? <laughs> are we? yeah 50 percent. it's the it's the 50 percent stupider rule uh, 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 all of a sudden you think you know everything sounds great in the studio and you're like oh i totally got this and then the people are looking at you and you're like fuck what is all this stuff <laughs> Where is, what do i do with it uh, how does this work again ah. <laughs> but i feel the same steve when when i started performing with tony i was like well if anything goes wrong he's got it he's got your back <laughs> oh, I, 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 I thought it was the other way around <laughs> but that's good that's good <laughs> So we both thought the other one was going like, to take care of it. So, yeah, somehow but it why, worked. But that's why I also decided I don't want to do this alone. I need to, I want to have it with two people. It's just more yeah, fun, I guess. It's a lot, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. That, 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 it's a really uh, unique, deep kind of communication between two people, isn't it? Yeah. When, when you, when you perform, when you improvise yeah, yeah. live in that way, it's, it's really, really good. But you guys perform also impro improvise or yeah. you have pre-program? Yeah. It's also completely... No, yeah, that's yeah. The I mean, we... You mean you might have some riffs in the drum machine? Exactly. Or whatever. Not, I mean, I, but I mean, we don't know what the other one's going to do, if, if, right. yeah, yeah. If, if you know what I mean. We, don't, we, haven't, yeah, yeah. we haven't figured something out. We just figure it out when we're, when we're there. Yeah, but it's not that you do guys do like some uh, guys like a back to back. It's you one track and then Tony one track and back and forth. You just together. Together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You you're just have to. That's, that's you have best. to just yeah. listen really carefully yeah. and not not just listen to what you're doing. I don't know. You, you just have to keep your your ears really open and. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good, you know. And Colleen will bring yeah. some part in and. It's like, yeah, oh exactly. yeah, that's great, and and you just kind of go with that, and you just make kind of be able to to um, you know, if you hear the other person do something, be able to step back a little bit and give them some yeah. room to do that, mm. and then yeah, yeah. and then it it's good because it gives you some time to like get your next bit ready yeah, exactly. to, to bring yeah. in. Yeah. yeah, it really is about restraint is a huge thing I found yeah. because you you know you have to feel comfortable to. To hang back because you know the nerves you get the nerves the crowd is there and you're like oh and if it's not sounding good like tony and i've talked the more manic you are about it when things you don't feel like it's going well and then mm. you have to like take a breath and be like everything's 
<laughs> yeah, some, sometimes the more you do, sometimes the more you do, the more you ruin it. You know, if, yeah, if something yeah, exactly. is sounding nice, the best thing you could do is just step back and get your hands off the gear for, for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah, so something you learn with I like, time. I, I like our idea about having a, having a couch. We always... <laughs> talked about that many times how that no, would really suit down. with me me and Joachim we <laughs> definitely need to involve a couch in it yeah and a box of cigars and a box it's a of long, cognac it's a long it's a long session so a fireplace <laughs> <laughs> Te bring your own fireplace <laughs> yeah. B Y O F P yeah. no fireplace no show <laughs> it's on the rider yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but um between you and uh, between uh, um Colleen and Tony do you do you um um pre-listen to stuff before you bring it in because that's that's sort of like the system um how how it developed here at the store sessions you know we have um, a bunch of stuff running and uh, uh when the other person is doing something or bringing something in you can on your on the, on the PFL you can kind of uh do something which might go along with that or complement it and then you can always decide to to bring it in or, or leave it and do something else but at least you have something ready to to shoot or to go to bring in uh when things need like an extra lift or a change or something is that how you how you do it as well or is it everything always on at the same time it's always a mystery of like <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I understand I, would, yeah. I, I understand how that could that could work but for me if i if i pre-listen to something i just find it so distracting because it's sort of it, it takes me out of the music that's happening that people can hear and i like that aspect that that what we can hear is what the crowd can hear and so i'll bring a new part i mean i think colleen does this as well you bring a new part in and you just you've Hope got to make best. it work <laughs> yeah. whatever it is yes yeah, fingers crossed. Oh, if it's if it's, okay. if it's if it's crap you're like well i, I gotta kind of bend this yeah, somehow and, <laughs> and you make yeah you make it work somehow and um i i've thought i've thought about the pre-listening thing but to me that that just takes me out of the music that's happening somehow i don't know yeah i I, I, I understand yeah, thing, I, I guess exactly. but yeah i understand I just what you're saying right in it the, the whole time and yeah. just just go with that the, the whole flow of the music yeah. yeah i think i think what i mean is somewhere between uh actually making something to go along with it or and your <laughs> method of bringing something in because it's more about um it's yeah. It's it's also sort of like a sound check, you know. If if you use a mono synth or something with a simple sequencer, and you tap in something, uh, it's just a way to hear that it's actually working and doing the thing you thought it was would be doing. So yeah. it's not. It just it just uh, confirms. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, what, no, what you, you, you what you were trying totally to program. Right. You're totally right, Joachim. I'm. No, it yeah, is. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> I mean, of course, when you when you bring it in, even especially when when. Uh, music is playing very loud you you kind of miss the, the the tonality sometimes or the actual pitch of things they could they could try you know be um you could misinterpret the um, uh pitches of things if if it's loud or if, if it's messy or there's a lot of reverb going on so you can you can never really really rely on what you hear in your headphones because it's right. yeah it's confusing so um it is just for me it's just a way to confirm the thing is actually playing yeah. And and it does something, and then yeah. you know you throw it you throw it in and take it from there. Basically, that's the, that's what I do. I but it's, I did. it's funny. Oh, sorry. Oh no, no it's all right. Carry on. It's funny you guys mention this because for me, when Jochem asked me and I knew what I was going to bring, I was worried like, how am I going to pitch everything without mm, knowing? Right. Because it's it's a bit weird to do that on an ARP sequence. If you just do do anything and then put it on, I think you can easily have something weird. But then uh, this mixer was there, this old Soundcraft that Luke used the week before. And then Jochem tells me, yeah, you can put a headphone in and there's PFL on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I had to say to him, what the fuck? I have this mixer at home. I had it for 20 years, 15 <laughs> years, and I didn't know that. <laughs> so it was a funny moment again, like a, a yeah. mixer that I used. But then again, yeah, 
of course, uh, at home in the studio, I never used it like that. So yeah. I didn't have to know about right. this thing. But yeah. that but was you, actually a lifesaver for me. Yeah. But did you did you actually end up using it like that though? I used it all the time. Constantly. Yeah, the pre -fell. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Especially to make uh, make riffs and and, and mm. the drums and things. Yeah, it was for me. It was a lifesaver. Mm, cool. So I need yeah, it basically. I, I like for me, it's uh, the live performance angle. Like I really value the fact that it is a live performance, and what that does for <clears> me <throat> is take me out of not just the music, but the actual performance that people are perceiving where people think, oh, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, with the same with Tony, like I really value the, the actual performance. So if when you do that, it kind of distracts you. And for me, what I do is the things I would do with Tony are not the things I would ever do with my own live set. So mm. keeping things like very, very, very simple patterns, super simple, you know, kind of more percussive stuff works better or, you know, pads that you can easily change if it's sounding terrible. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I also, yeah, I, with so many things to do, adding another step of like pre-listening to something is like too much for my brain. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it is oh. a better idea for a better it result. Did, that is it did, it did remind me, uh, there was, there was a time when I did a, this kind of hybrid DJ set more kind of ambient stuff where i i was i was djing but i was doing some kind of euro rack stuff over it and i did i did use um a queuing kind of thing then because i was trying to i was making sure what i was doing was um uh like basically in key um with with like the drones and stuff like that and that mm. that worked a lot better but it was a much kind of slower process um but I guess that's much better, maybe with two people. At least for me, it was also a resting point to to calm down and think, okay, what's next? Mm. Right. And then listen to what Jochem is playing, and then try to add something that fits in in in, in that way. Yeah, here's something that uh, connects to what we're talking about. Uh, question for both duos. I guess that's Colleen and Surgeon and Steve and me. Uh, how do you guys communicate what key you are in? Uh, no. when you're going, going to make significant changes. I mean, we I think we've already kind of answered that question, but uh, the key, to be honest, to me, I think pitch is overrated. Uh, <laughs> or hard. Amen. I mean, the, Amen. Uh, well, the thing is, you know, in techno no. or, you know, improvisation kind of allows you to, to have things... Uh, <laughs> Oh, what's going on? Uh, the, is that your mushrooms? Uh, oh my god! <laughs> Sorry. I don't see anything. What do you mean? <laughs> what, 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 what was that? What was that? It's kicking in now, eh, Tony? Uh, yeah. <laughs> She's like, I took some now. <laughs> <laughs> so flying <cat. laughs> I, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> what? What were you saying about key? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid to say it again Overrated. because I don't want to. I don't want to cause us seeing cats again. So. <laughs> Overrated. Yeah, yeah. Well, no. I mean, the overrated. It's. It's. I. I think the this sort of way of playing. Um, it kind of allows to have things going into friction a little bit uh, and not be uh, totally smooth and, and perfectly in key all the time. I, it, it, you know, it's, I think especially this sort of raw um, techno-ish stuff um, and this way of playing, um, um, yeah, I, I mean, this, I don't think any one of us has ever thinking about scales or anything it's just uh stuff that sounds good or that uh, has yeah, a certain yeah. energy or a certain yeah, yeah. um vibe to it i think that's the that's something that is more on my mind than actual um perfect keys or or chords that are supposed to be um official legit chords you know um so so there isn't really any um or there's not really much thought going on i mean it, like i said the or when i explained the preview thing um i might uh when when i when i listen to whatever's going on 
um, include some of the notes or whatever that that are going on. But uh, at the same time, um, I divert from it as well um, to hopefully uh, do something which becomes interesting. I don't know. It's just uh, it's all it's all very much on the fly. I mean, it's 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 um i would say playing live i don't know what would you guys think but playing live is um is so intense and so it's almost like time slows down in a sense yeah. and yeah. and and you are as much a spectator of the whole thing as as an actor in the whole thing so it's it's like Absolutely. you're on both sides you know so you're you're as much surprised or uh, new it's it's as new to you as anybody yeah. who's listening to you so um so yeah, there's there's these two things, and and you're you're acting on whatever is going on, but uh, yeah, there's no way to to predict the future, or uh, it's very much in the moment. It's a very much yeah. um, um, a real time thing. What do you think? But that's the nice yeah. thing, I think. I remember when we were playing, and then all of a sudden we had this ambient kind of thing with a strange beat. And I was like, wow, this is yeah. amazing. Mm. And we ended up there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, I love ma that magic. Yeah, yeah. It's it's totally, total magic. totally magical. Totally, yeah. But yeah. The, uh, and I love the freedom. It's 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 great. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's um I, I just try to do everything I can to just really be the only way I can describe it is just really inside the music and not be kind of thinking about thinking in a in a in a rational and logical way it's just like just really working on intuition and i think maybe the question talked about asked about how how you communicate and and to me yeah play you know playing live generally is a really really loud environment and if you're trying to actually say something to the person you're performing with, it's a disaster because you're like, <laughs> bring the snare drum in. And you're like, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. You know, it doesn't work. You've got to no. you've got to do it on a nonverbal level. That's mm. to me, yeah. that's the only way it can work. And you just got to be both kind of plugged into this same stream of music and you just mm. kind of intuitively know yeah, you what sounds it. good. What doesn't, and you just yeah. got to work with that, and not not try to kind of mentally plan it out and shout at each other. You know, I don't know. That's that's. I, I just can't hear anything in those situations. Mm. So. That's the thing that you know we um, that the more it's with me and Tony. It's like the more time we spend together as friends, the better our live set is, and I'm sure it's the same. For everybody, you know, um, you know, instead of these, some agency setting up, you know, some kind of oh here, you know, like two artists when you feel like there's not a connection, like any B two B thing, when you have like a, it's just so human, so that when you're on the length wavelength with somebody, the more time you're able to spend with them, like before the show, the better it always is, because you're like in the zone with each other on a on a friendship level. And that's, that's the mood. You know what I mean? That's the, all those things are so important is they're totally not technical and not like just everything we do with emotion and yeah. spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. So that's why with people who are doing duos, you know, it's really important that you, that you choose the right person to do it with, mm -hmm. that you have a vibe and you're on the same level as a person. So that's really and it's the same idea of what it is, why you're doing it, you're not necessarily like what it wants to sound like, but what is what are you trying to like the same idea of what you want to say with your live set. And so that's also super important, I think. Do you do you guys, uh, Colleen and um, Tony, uh, discuss a direction or an aesthetic in advance, or are you are you just going with whatever happens when you press start? Well, I don't know. Sometimes we've had we've had kind of vague, yeah, we've had sort of vague ideas. But maybe it's something we might say to each other right before we play or something like mm. that. But even that can just go out the window as well sometimes. Mm. And it depends on what gear we're using. That's a huge mm. thing. Mm. Like if we're using something different, or depending on what I bring or what tone we communicate about what gear we're bringing. And then that kind of determines something about what's going to happen, hopefully. <laughs> so yeah. So how how does Very it work fun. for you, Yoko? Magical. 
Um, well, Colleen was just mentioning vibe. Um, I think, uh, well, I haven't played live for an audience uh, for a while. You know, I did I did a lot of that in the in, in the two thousands. Um, but um, for the live sets here, you know, the, the whole store environment, the, whole, the studio is set up. Uh, so when you walk in, it sounds and it looks uh, a like a place where you really want to, where you, where you can relax and where you really want to create something. And uh, I've noticed that with everybody who's coming here, um, uh, it's not really that special, but it's it's not uh, like a cold place or uh, an unfamiliar environment. It's um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's put together in a way that um, um, that instantly takes you uh, yeah, takes your mind off all the possible distractions, and and you just go for the for what you hear for 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 the result or. Um, yeah, it makes uh, I don't know, but I mean, you, you, Stephen and Tony have been here. I mean, um, See, yeah, it's, in a it's museum like... and a studio, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well, the, 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 the relaxed, like museum. Museum. <laughs> yeah, the relaxed thing, and it, it, it is, you know, it's it's this bunker, so everything is, you know, once once you're in there, you, you know, the outside world doesn't really exist, and mm. um, and it, yeah, it is it is really relaxed in there. It's it's really conducive to. And these speakers, yeah. oh man! I remember <laughs> he was cracking up the one on one in the low end, and I was sitting there like, "When are they gonna pop?" And <laughs> it was so low and so loud. And, but then he was telling me the difference between the headroom and and the power, let's say, of the the one on one. That there was so much more power in the speakers that you that could easily bear it. it was, I, I think I've never heard that before. Uh, Maybe in a mastering studio or something. Mm. It's yeah, it's a really it's special, a, really, really special this kind of sound in the studio. It it does have a, a certain sound, yeah. And but and the cool thing is, is that it carries uh, throughout the whole room. So everywhere you are, you you have decent sound. It's not really that loud, though. You say you, you mentioned it's loud, and but I don't no, think but it's more that for loud. me, it, let's say if you take the <laughs> lowest note of a mini mook. On the normal speaker, you're scared they're gonna pop. Ah, okay. And I was sitting there all the time when you were doing this with the one on one, like oh, but then, uh. then you explained that they have so much more power that it's no problem to just hit the lowest note. And yeah, what I think is important is that that um, uh, that you really hear what you're doing without yeah. ever having to guess what's heck, what's going on. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, and it and it helps the performance um, mm. because uh, you never really worried about sound and you don't hear it just screaming from from one corner or something. It's just yeah. you're all engulfed or you know sort of surrounded by it. And um, yeah, it, it it works really well for these for these live sets. Yeah, for sure. I guess a good description is like really loud bass and not distorted at all. Mm. Normally the whole speaker would distort and stuff would sound bad, but this was completely wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's vibey. Yeah. Vibey. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I, I want to want to continue this this thing about um this being in the moment because uh i rediscovered that since since i've done these uh, live sets and i think it's a very special feeling it's a very special uh, state to be in uh, you get it in cert to a certain extent when you when you dj uh but playing live is, is sort of um tenfold the same feeling because it's it's really um yeah, in the moment. How do you how do you experience it when you play by yourself, uh, Colleen or Tony? Because um, if we, if you play together, you you can rely on each other, kind of, or sort of. You always have a backup. Uh, but when you play by yourself, it must be uh, even more intense, right? Yeah, I have always have more <laughs> than one. I have more than one kick drum. As as long as I mean, Tony's make a stroke. As long as it's a kick drum, it's techno. So you have to have two kick drums just in case there's no kick drum. <laughs> <laughs> a and everything kick else. Drum. Yeah, exactly. Kick drum on a hi hat. You could get away with like maybe 30 minutes, I'd say, of yeah. just a kick drum. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's as long as yeah, I think the key is just to, you know, for me when I'm doing my sets individually, I plan them out a lot more. 
than mm-hmm. I would do with Tony. When you're with somebody else, you can't plan it, you know, especially if you don't like have ch- chance to rehearse or whatever. Mm-hmm. So mine are much more planned when it's by myself because, you know, you they have to deliver. When you're in a club, you have to deliver. You know what I mean? And <clears throat> the pressure of especially going before and after a DJ, you know, where everything is, you know, on every four bars, there's a change and it's all mm. mastered. So like, you know, you have to kind of adjust. So you really have to be on point with your arrangement um, when that's the environment. So I have to, I pre-prepare a lot more for a set at a club or a festival. But um, do you always use your preparation though? Or do you also have moments where you kind of divert from whatever you planned and just go off into a different direction? I usually don't. No, okay. No, yeah. I when I'm with that's why I like it's so nice to perform with other people because then you can really go for it and just listen mm. and feel something. But I feel a lot of pressure uh to have everything planned so that again, so that if something goes wrong, I can still adjust if something goes wrong. I always have a backup it's always important not to have one sequencer. You have to have at least, I have, I like to have three sequencers so that, you know, then your changes can be really smooth. And if something goes wrong, you still have another option. And then I do have one sequencer that is only improvised. You can't um, actually program it. So I always have that. So yeah, I guess I do go into other zones sometimes, Hmm. but, uh, yeah, I would, I feel a lot of pressure, especially during at a club to keep it in a DJ box of like, you know, there's very strict parameters for what it, people are going to expect here at a club when people are DJing. So I feel like I got to fit it into that. So, and I like to focus again on the performance aspect of it because, you know, you're there with people performing and it's very important to me to connect with the crowd on an energy level so that if you have everything sort of sorted out this blueprint, you know, you don't have to like spend your time being anxious in front of a crowd trying to like fix something or write a sequence really quick that you're like, you know, and you look visibly stressed out. So mm. it's really important for me to have it like that. I can change it if I want to, but to direct the performance and energy out is important mm. for me. So. Yeah. What about you, Tony? <laughs> uh, I think um, when yeah, when I when I play live on my own, it's a lot harder to um, it's a lot harder to enjoy it maybe than with, <laughs> with two people because yeah. there's not it's harder to have this uh, you can have a breather and step back a little bit, but I think that it was definitely inspired by watching Colleen perform and it was quite a long time ago because I I I was re- I really had this mindset of oh I've really got to like improvise all this and create it all from scratch and I was really making it very hard for myself and being very kind of purist about it and I watched Colleen perform live I think it was yeah it was at a festival and normally we always play together but for some reason we were like maybe one after the other or something playing on her own I saw her play and I saw I heard how she was she'd um was using riffs that she'd prepared and I was like yeah that worked really well you know it was still really flexible very live very in the moment but she wasn't just needlessly making the job really hard <laughs> for her uh, and that's exactly what I was doing it's like why was I doing that so I you know I come a bit more I, I come a bit more um with, I don't know, I'm just not making it quite as hard for myself as I used to be. I, I would program some sequences and I would, uh, if I used the Octa track, I would have some like rough backing atmosphere or something like that just to, just so I'm not making it so incredibly hard because like Colleen said, the problem is when you come on after a DJ who's playing finished pieces of music, and you're like scrabbling around in the dirt trying to like <laughs> make some techno out of like nothing out of bits of dust it's like mm-hmm. yeah people are like 
what is this? You know, <laughs> it's not boom there straight away. Yeah. So uh, it's yeah, it's hard to. Um, so yeah, uh, some kind of balance of of um, something to fall back on a little bit more, but but is is sort of just flexible enough to really have fun with. Yeah. Um, otherwise, otherwise, it's just a night. It's just yeah. a nightmare. It's just you're just in a constant state of panic, and that's um, yeah. I, I a constant that, state that, of that, panic. <laughs> yeah, I realized that wasn't so much fun, but you know, I, I had to learn. I had to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's why I don't want to do it alone. Because you don't want to be in a state of panic all, all the time. <laughs> yeah, Probably it's, alone, it's, I would be for sure. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's fun for sure. Two two people playing live is is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, we should have more of that in the future. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, do you we guys talk think... about it after this? Because there was something. Yeah, I was Sorry? thinking like, is it going to change? Like, what you've been doing in lockdown is going to change what you're going to do in the future. Like, Yakum, are you going to do more live sets? You think? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on your, like on your own after the lockdown is. Yeah, or or collaborations. I don't know. I mean, I think for 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 the foreseeable time, small venues with seated audiences and and live performances like this like this are probably the the way to go for now. Yeah. So um. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Steve, I think I know the answer to that one. <laughs> to be honest, I was, you're gonna live live performances. I was never ever into it at all, and really hard to convince, but. Yeah, and this performance convinced me in one take, and I learned a lot about the setup, and that I don't want to do it alone, and yeah, and I want to do it on the fly as well because yeah, I, I hate to, to to take my studio down and then I can't work, and and it's just more fun. I mean, yeah, exactly. It was so much more relaxing than to think about oh, I have all this riff I have to go through and pre-program, and yeah, this this, this is great. I think, uh, I when when yeah. I speak to people, I, I find that most people have the idea of of uh, it's like a, a rock band kind of idea where where you want to kind of play live and and perform your greatest hits live and and I I've kind of completely abandoned that with 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 techno live and just going for a just a, mm. a kind of new a new kind of improvised uh, thing. Um, I think I, totally I think that, that that really got in the way for me. Well, years ago, I, I when I tried approaching playing live, it was more about recreating my tracks, and that that just really got in the way for me. And and I ended mm. up just with a really boring um, setup, and I just didn't enjoy it at all. And it was kind of I abandoned the idea of playing live for a long I, time. I totally understand you because this. Mm. Re, uh, pre, uh, replaying your old tracks was exactly what was holding me back because mm. if I have to look for all this data, I have to go back to the Atari <laughs> oh, yeah. and load up all the yeah. things, look through the, all yeah. the disks I have to, to capture all the data. And I was like, no, I don't want to no. go there. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, the yeah, best is to, to don't play any of your tracks that yeah. people know. And, I understand how, you know, it might totally makes sense from a kind of marketing point of view. Of about, course, you yeah, know, it does. Doing yeah. an album and touring the album and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but of course. I don't know, it just doesn't, yeah. yeah the last really last time I, I toured extensively with, with the live show, I did it the other way around. I just toured for two or three years with, uh, with a bunch of gear. And mm. uh, every two weeks or maybe every week I did, uh, I added some uh, some new programming in my arsenal so I could do something new every weekend. And then after about two years, uh, I had a massive amount of um, tracks that came out of the live performance situations because, um, yeah, you approach your stuff differently if you perform it. So they were all, they all were sort of, they found their form by playing them over and over again so they found this yeah. this sort of uh, yeah conclusion you know so um and then uh, when i when i um had them all uh, kind of down uh i recorded them as an album <laughs> mm -hmm. so right. it it was the other way around and so i i didn't have to um do this to me absolutely boring thing of replaying tracks that you've already done because uh, <laughs> once i'm done with something i want to forget about it and move on to something new. Uh, Absolutely. 
but, but but this yeah yeah but but this way it, it sort of still made sense to do um, makes sense that way around was that the the loud yeah. boxer project project yeah yeah exactly yeah mm. yeah that yeah. makes sense yeah i see some some other great live performance showing up in the kink is here oh, oh, so. oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> good to see him here Yay. hello and uh, another live performer uh, hey. Tom, Dennis. Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah, now you th when you think about it, there's actually a lot of people who um, who are capable of um, doing amazing live stuff. Have you ever seen Dennis play live? No. Monopoly. He is, uh, well, recently he's been doing these um, uh, live sets with um, uh, testing equipment. So oh, basically, yeah. he has like a, I don't know, two hundred kilos worth of uh, massive boxes. <laughs> oh, he sent me some recordings. Oh, yeah. to download them. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. yeah I've, I've seen him at uh, free rotation. He's uh, yeah, exactly he free rotation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's the um, the hard way of doing it, but it's but it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> hard way. <laughs> yeah, carrying all this stuff around, man. It's respect for the guy. <laughs> You yeah. have hardware and you have hard way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> hard wave. It's a new uh, genre. <laughs> uh, so, what does your um, setup look like? Is it always the same, or um, Colleen? Is it? Do you? You said you sometimes bring new gear when you play with Tony, but is that true for your your own? um uh, live show as well no it, it'll change occasionally but i've had the same setup well this is the this is the joy uh the good thing about using your rack because uh you don't have to change you just put one module in it's a totally different thing so yeah right. i should say i'm like oh no it's the same stuff but it's actually not it's the same physical pieces of equipment but there's different things inside the box so but i try to stay with in fact this is something i learned from tony like you have to stay with um you have to resist the temptation that some new piece of gear is going to make your life set good because it won't <laughs> it'll only make it worse <laughs> so if you stick with the same life set and this because the more you uh when it has that synergy and it works all together and you know exactly what's going to happen then that's when you really solidify your sound uh you can get yourself out of any problem that you have you know, mm. that's, the, that's the biggest part, a huge part of a life set is to be able to extract yourself from a disaster somehow. You're yeah, like, yeah. okay, how do I get out of this? And the more you know your equipment, that's where it's so important because you can quickly alter something uh, or, you know, figure out something else to do or something's going wrong. You know, you know how to troubleshoot it and all kinds of things like that. So I find, uh, and just muscle memory also when you're performing so that you know, like a guitarist wouldn't play a different guitar every night of a show. That's how I see it. So having your sure. own piece of like equipment, the way you know it, set up in exactly the same position on the table so that it's always the same. So you're just da -da 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 -da, and then it's like go time. Yeah, your yeah. setup is basically your instrument. Yeah, yeah exactly. The whole of its entirety is yeah, the instrument. It's the instrument so. Yeah. There are definitely <laughs> times when, when I've totally ignored my own advice though, where <laughs> yes, like, yeah. I get... I, I would uh, so many times this has happened with with the Eurorack where it's like I would get like some module would arrive like the night before I'm gonna go away on the weekend and I can't resist it I'm like putting it in the rack and it's like oh no it doesn't work oh no it's yeah Sounds disaster horrible. but I I know it's the wrong thing to do but I can't I just can't help myself <laughs> sometimes but I'm saying no telling everyone else not not to do that, but then I totally do it. <laughs> No, but, but you yeah, do I, have to trial by fire with new like oscillators. Yeah, it's, but I suppose it's about not not changing too much too quickly. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, because you end up with a completely new instrument, and you're standing in front of a crowd going, "Oh, I don't <clears> really <throat> know what I'm doing." Have you ever have you ever had the, been in a situation where you thought something was going to uh, work really well, but um, co totally misjudged 
the power <laughs> it had or the less the lack of power it had on oh, a, all the time. I think you really get that with live before you know it's if if you're yeah using different gear or different modules something can sound amazing at home and you play it live and it's like where is it yeah, <laughs> yeah. There. and other things are like whoa you know um, yeah that's i really yeah i really find that with yeah with your rack stuff it's quite i don't know what what how about you have you used your rack stuff in a kind of live situation Joachim? um no uh no but i i use it in the studio a lot but um never live i think um i use the octatrack which is very reliable yeah yeah in terms of sound you know it, yeah. it, it there's it's hardly ever surprising uh yeah. in terms of the way it sounds um so that's that's a uh, yeah but with different oscillators with, with yeah in, in, in I can Europe, imagine. It's, it's there's a yeah. huge uh there, there's there are big surprises and you just don't know until you you play live whether it's gonna be really good or not so how do you deal with that is the do you split everything out like on your rack is there are there different signals going to different channels on your desk or do you have like a, just a stereo out synth um channel uh, or, or can you still kind of correct for unexpected weirdness there, there have been a lot of different <laughs> There have been a lot of different approaches, but I don't know sometimes the rack has a lot of kind of submixers and filters in it, which everything's going through. And there might be like a main stereo out and then like a bunch of other separate outs, but it's, it's varied a lot, but I mean, I don't know, just, um, just the power of different oscillators is it varies a lot. And if, if something's just not really cutting it, I, I, it's sort of one of these things where just turning it up isn't really doesn't really solve it it's it's mm. something about the kind of body of it i mm. can't really explain mm. and, um, do you do you um how do you deal with dynamics because especially um <clears throat> synths or eurorack stuff um they can be insanely dynamic um and um you're never going to be as compact sounding as uh, DJs performing on the same night. So is there something you use to make it sound more compact or are you just leveling things more carefully? How do you, how do you deal with that? Because um, I know from experience that dynamic stuff um, can be perceived as lower in volume or lower in energy, mm. if you know what I mean? Uh, even though it's louder on, on the meters or whatever, but it, it still sort of uh, sounds some less depends on the room of course but um sometimes i think we struggle with that and that was that thing about going on after djs who were playing these like brick wall limited yeah. tracks but um in terms I, I think just kind of like fading stuff in uh seemed to seem to work and um there i think there's ways with um cv controlling things to sort of be able to set Kind of upper and lower limits of of reasonable like a reasonable range that kind of thing um but you don't use any compression or um no but i have i i have a setup which is kind of based around an octa track and a, a lep loop and i actually put that through um the what is it the boom is it the, oh, the, yeah, the machines yeah. so i think for years, I was saying, "Oh no, don't use a compressor." And then I tried a compressor. Was like, "Oh, that's kind of good," but I don't know. but it has. To, I know I'm using it in a very different way. I'm. I have. I have to have a very stripped down sound to use such a heavy compressor without it sounding mm. like crap. Because if I if I'm putting a load of complex detail in, yeah, I'd I'd rather not compress it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've used the 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 boom or bam, whatever they, they mm. call it, um, a lot when when playing here in the, the the live sessions and it's it's um it's as much an effect i guess as a yeah yeah compressor. so you can also use it to color the sound or filter it um yeah it does it does take care of uh, some of the crazy peaks you can get i use it mostly on drums though yeah yeah i just i just had it on the whole the kind of whole output of, of that particular setup but i had to be really careful oh, about how okay. how i balanced everything um 
with it. But yeah, that worked pretty well. But I don't know. How do you, um, how do you find it, Colleen? Because when I, I don't know, from my point of view, when I hear you play, it's it sounds really kind of clear and punchy. You sound like a record. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, you've heard it too. Yeah. But... Yeah, 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 yeah. You do. You do sound like a record. Oh. I, I put no I try to figure out a compression solution that I haven't can't figure it out. So yeah, I don't know. I see I don't have a submix in my um in my well actually no that's not Colleen <laughs> turned into craft work now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, are you back? No. <laughs> Uh oh. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can hear you. At least we hear you again. Are you still there? Oh. <laughs> What's happening? Oh, okay. Uh, there you are. <laughs> uh, you, you were talking about a you, you don't have a sub mixer in your in your rack. I I actually do, but I don't have like a mixer. I lied. I was like, wait, no, I don't. Oh, I don't. Have, I don't have a sub mixer, but I do. <clears> but I don't. But no, uh, I want a mixer in it. So that I can only have two, one stereo output from my Euro rack, because I have anxiety about setting up when I get to a club, and I'd like to set up like in fifteen minutes or less. This is my goal. I don't like taking a long time for that, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. It seems ridiculous, but somehow that stresses me out. So I just want to be able to plug it in. And in fact, I actually did. Um, I've now decided to use a DJ mixer to do my live sets and I mm. figured out how to do it. And it's so much better for me uh, because, and I like the pioneer uh, DJ M if you can believe it. I know people don't like that mixer, but because like it's so it. simple and it has effects on it and you can just, the, I like to filter and everything. It's so simple. And it was so great because there's so many things that uh, you know, when you have so many channels, you can't cut things in and out in a way that like keeps things moving because there's too much to, you know, you can't do things very fast or you have to like remember where you are and it's dark and you can't see anything. And so I managed to get four outputs of everything. So this is good, but I'm working on getting it even less. So that, yeah, it makes that, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it's much yeah. easier too, and less space. Uh, yeah, and they're they're, yeah. they're built for performance, and and a studio yeah. mixer is built to exactly. manage sound basically. Exactly. Uh, you you exactly. can perform on a on a live mixer, but a, a DJ mixer is a uh, uh, yeah, it's just the layout is simpler, and uh, yeah. usually <laughs> EQ filters are good, so you you can yeah. make big movements on a DJ mixer. You yeah. can cut out every all the bass of all the channels in in one yes. go. And you still have your auxiliaries if you have a good one. Yeah, I think that was the great thing in our our performance that the the big mixer went through your DJ mixer and you could do things that I would never be able to do with yeah. so many channels. Oh, altogether. is that how you guys did it? That's yeah, how yeah. The, the big you. mixer oh, okay. went through his. Yeah. Oh, nice. It was perfect. Yeah. Because exactly yeah. what you're just uh, describing, Colleen. Yeah. That, yeah. There's so much channels and you, you can't do a whole bass a kill yeah. just on the kick, yeah. on the, and that's it. And he could exactly. do the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> It was perfect. Yeah. So you're trying to figure out which channel the kick's on. Yeah. Like, <laughs> one, one, two, three, four. Oh, That's usually oh, there for me. Always number one. Always put it at one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Keep it easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had it that bad on that mixer that Jochem had that my whole channel sounded different because I had it 15 years on the same channel. So this whole really? channel one huh. was completely sounding different. Oh, really? The other channels. Yeah. 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 The kick changed the channel. Actually. Wow! Oh, on your own mixer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the the, the old uh, soundcraft, yeah. the one you have there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it, it, it. It's, your signature kick is a basically a damaged channel. Yeah, <laughs> that was indeed probably the old 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 signature kick because I, yeah. I, I would never be able to get it back like that so far now. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful mistakes. <laughs> yeah, but using a DJ mixer for live shows, I think for live performances, um, uh, for me, it works really well because um, things that you program into your um, sequencers and drum machines, um, whether it's pre-programmed or you're doing doing it on the fly, I, there's only only 
so much you can do with two hands and uh, things become really loopy or slow evolving if if you only have a stereo output or if you yeah. uh, split things over a live desk. Yeah. But if you have a DJ mixer with just a, the main sort of group split out um, or the sort of the categories grouped in, in on four DJ channels or six, uh, it makes you... It, it makes yeah it's you're capable of making big movements like uh uh yeah put effect on on a on a on a whole group or yeah. cut out a bass or uh or you know just uh, fade them up, fade things in and out quickly yeah uh, so yeah it works it works really well it's uh um, yeah. it narrows things down yeah yeah I like, I like it's too. big of life changing for my uh live setup a recent development. I see that Kink likes uh, the Pioneer DJ mixer for mm. live set also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I find the Zone 96 was, or 96 is too many things already. Too many? Pioneer. Yeah, already, yeah. Because oh. if like the DJ <laughs> mixer, I was like, uh, I know it's very unpopular, but I really like the onboard effects of a Pioneer mixer. Yeah, that's the advantage. You don't have to bring yeah. extra extra yeah. boxes. Yeah, exactly. that's true. Yeah. And then I'm in a situation where I'm doing a bunch of cable connecting anyway, which is what I was trying to avoid. So <laughs> Yeah, I've tried the, the, the DB4 as well, the Alan and Heath DB4. Oh yeah. It's got uh, actually it's got an effect processor per channel. So it's got oh, four. It? Yeah. Ooh. Uh, Great. EQ, yeah, it's a really deep uh, mixer. Uh, it's less um, uh, rough in a sense that that it's it uh, you, it makes you play more sort of fluid, uh, fluently, yeah. or more sort of slow evolving. That's oh, what wow. you know, the machine kind of the demands or does to your it's performance. Like digital, I that's why. Right. Yeah, it's digital. Um, yeah. Well, it's got analog inputs, but I think everything's going through a digital. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know, but it's it's got a uh, EQ per channel, which is switchable to filter and kill so you have three modes on each channel you can use them um you can s set every channel to do whatever you want and then you, oh, have, wow. the, you have a dry wet or a send uh, per channel into its own effects um, processor so you have four different ones and it's um yeah it's it's a really nice performance desk too but it's um it's hard to get so it's um, yeah it's difficult not to, good for the rider no. <laughs> they're like yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Is it that hard to get? Um, yeah, I've tried it a few times, and it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it had to come from a different country twice, so it's um, okay. it's, it's it's not as common as a uh, Allen and Heath ninety six or ninety two or. I or still a have it here. Yeah. We'll have a look in, <laughs> look better look at it. Still. Mm. Yeah. But Steve, you when you write music, um, I, I I assume you've always. Uh, or you do, you do have experience with uh, performing things, right? In, in not for an audience, but your your tracks and your music uh, does have a, this sort of live feel to it. So you do have experience in oh yeah performing. Yeah. I mean, or... Exactly. I, I usually I, I do my tracks in the studio live. I mean, since yeah. maybe since the digital area came, I do a mixture of uh, depends on my mood, how I feel, or where I, where I am, but. In general, I try to do the the live thing. I just uh, set everything up, mix it, and then press start and see where it goes. For the feel, it's it's I think the the nicest because sometimes I I do the the whole copy and and, and pasting thing, uh, and then when you do it live, it has a completely different feel, a better flow than when you copy it all the time and think too much about it. Because mm -hmm. that's the thing: if you do it live, you you hardly think, you just do. You feel and you do. Yeah. And that that's for me the nicest thing, thing as well. Especially when you listen back as well, you you can feel the flow of things. Instead of that you know it's blocked and it's copied and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's more intuitive, I guess. Yeah, yeah totally. And then, and then you just uh, bounce everything to stereo and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Keep, yes. keep it. <laughs> I, I try lately to um, record a few channels, at least the channels that I filter a lot or change live, mm. a lot of stuff, because, yeah, that can be a pain if you 
do a faulty recording. You have to redo it again. And the take you just did was really perfect on certain things. But yeah, that's stuff I have to look into still because I'm, I'm still in a bit too hardware in that sense. But I still have to connect all my channels back to the mixer. Now I have maybe eight channels that I plug in here and there in the machine that I can record it. But I want to be able to to record 24 channels if uh, if I need to. So did you get rid of your Soundcraft mixer? Do you have something else now? Or I have a Ghost now. OK. I mean, the the one before was the one you had, the, the Spirit, Spirit Studio. Yeah. And before that, I had the Spirit Live. And for me, I still, that one had the best ever mid sweep that I heard in my life. I mean, I mean, uh, from, yeah, for the people who know that, yeah, that you know the track is Ashfix, but it's not Ashfix. It's actually X-Tracks, which means cross tracks. And mm -hmm. I used that mixer and I had two riffs of the same sound, I bent one to the left, one to the right. And there's this facing, a flanging effect in the track, which I actually do with cross uh, sweeping the, the sweeps left to right against each other, which gives this facing effect left and right, which, yeah, which people always think it's a machine, but it's just me doing live <laughs> sweeping on the thing. It's manual labor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's it's one of the few tracks that I actually mentioned according to the track. And what happened? The labels were printed the other way around. Yeah. So it became Ashfix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was for me really like, oh. Usually I just no. make up a title and because I don't really care it's about the music. And this one was really on purpose. OK, oh, no. cross tracks. <laughs> Yeah, that was it was oh, a hard one for sucks. me. <laughs> sucks. Every time it's like, oh, I love Ash Fiction. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to bring Kink back in because um, he's asking um, if we have, it's a question to all four of us, uh, if there is some kind of panic button or a reset thing, re reset solution if something goes wrong during a, mm -hmm. a live set or when it gets really messy, you know, when you tweak too, ma too much and you completely lose it. Um, I can be uh, quick to answer first for myself. No. <laughs> 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 no, whatever happens, happens. And um, to be honest, I feel quite uh, in my comfort zone when, I, when something happens that is unexpected because the end, it makes you work, work harder to sort of uh, find or maneuver your way out of it, which um, in some instances actually becomes something interesting, which you would have never come up with. Um, so uh, in my case, no. <laughs> I, I definitely experienced points, especially with the, the completely improvised uh, techno sets where um, it's starting to go wrong. And instead of trying to to save it i i let it kind of completely fall to pieces <laughs> and, and kind of to be, almost to become a thing so it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. instead like of strong... trying to like save it from itself i just let it like crash and burn and turn it into some like crazy weird bit of the set and then kind of build you know the phoenix rises from the ashes mm. or something mm. i don't know that's how i feel about it instead of trying to fix something that's going <laughs> wrong you just let it just crash and burn. i don't know it's just more dramatic in it yeah i don't know it, do, you, do you know what i mean it's somehow i don't know it's more it 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 makes you just pretend part. nothing is wrong basically. yeah yeah I just, <laughs> do, you, do you do you deliberately make it worse or are you just you you just hide it by i i, I let it, by, I by let it carry, carry on going yeah. in the in the in you know it's starting to fall apart so you just encourage it to fall apart yeah. even more <laughs> make it a feature know, it, yeah it becomes a feature then it's a thing instead yeah. of trying to <laughs> resist what it what it wants to do yeah somehow so um yeah, I guess that's the same for me, but uh, um, I don't, I don't, um, I don't mind if if things, yeah, yeah, uh, if things go not wrong, but in a way that you, that, that when some things happen that you was that were not doing intentionally or something uh, doesn't come across the way you imagined it would, you know, when you were trying to 
move towards something but uh but again i like i like this tension because that makes you uh be on your on the tip of your toes even even more and and um, it could sort of refocuses you and it's a, it's an exercise like in in like control and and how i don't know it's so volatile that you can't be completely in control of it and sometimes it's like it's like letting it just spin out of control and just yeah uh, and then i don't know and then i can kind of start again from a fresh you know and you just kind of build it back up again mm. maybe but i guess <laughs> for me as a non-experienced guy looking at that i guess it would be more difficult uh to, to let it run let's say if you have a plant set up with all your hits and stuff because then people immediately hear it completely goes wrong. Yeah. So I guess it's it's easier if you have an on the fly thing because you're mm. improvising anyway, and it doesn't matter where it goes. Yeah. You just exactly. gotta, gotta stand there and say, "Yeah, I meant to do that." Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean you don't like it? This is all planned. Yeah, yeah. you gotta sell oh, it. Get it. Which, oh, which get mistake? It. <laughs> yeah. It's it's the jazz, it's jazz, it's isn't it? It's like, yeah, I meant to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's you don't dramatic. like it? Oh well. Oh, you just, you just don't, get it. don't get it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to go over your head. Yeah. <laughs> there are many there are many ways of getting away with it. Yeah, one thing one thing you always should do though is act you know, whatever happens, whether it's intentional or falling apart just because you weren't in control, act always act af, as if it was intentional. <laughs> you, always act it, as, you, as, you're in, as if you're in control you know like uh absolutely yeah, it's supposed to happen you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> what about you colleen do you have a reset button or a plan b or a backup thing um, you... i mean no i mean not not really if i have if if i lose because if i lose like one element of it as long as not the kick drum which is why i have two kick drums uh, then you can do without it. You know what I mean? Like you really can, if just one voice or even two voices, you can still make something happen as long as, so I have a backup kick drum. Have they ever both failed at the same time? Then I would have to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> would have never you could take the microphone and sing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Beatboxing. Do a do a Yoko oh, on uh, Yoko that. Ono performance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be good. I was wondering if Kink has one, so maybe he can answer in the comments <laughs> if he has a backup plan. <laughs> yeah, let, let's give him some time. Maybe yeah. you, maybe um, he can come to the Discord server and uh, and. Uh, talk about this or maybe yeah. at some, some episode some in sometime in the future i'll i'll send him an email see if he wants to talk about yeah it, it would be great to have him on. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i request so. i put in a request okay <laughs> a formal request <laughs> i have lodged a submitted a formal request <laughs> i must say i i um played with um uh sample based instruments in the past with um I used to use in in that loudboxer era. I used to use um, mm -hmm. a setup with uh, two SU seven hundreds, mm -hmm. and uh, they are very fluid. They are they have, um, I think, eight channels, some one shot channels, and some loop channels. And but every channel had its own control. So uh, there were no songs. It would be, it was basically just if you would press start, it would just loop something, and then all of the dynamics needed to be done by hand you know so it was uh, sort of the whole flow and, and build up of, um, of the piece was performed um but they <coughs> also had uh scenes which meant uh you can you could bring it out of con out of control and make it completely chaos and chaotic and noisy uh and then just press one button button and go back into a scene so it would oh, sort wow. of all, all jump back to the, the same setting i don't think there's anything like that in in eurorec but um I think Colin told, was telling me he was working on some ideas to have macro control type things to control his URX so he could jump back to not really a preset but uh, control several things at the same time with one mm -hmm. one control button. I don't know. Is this something you would you would use if it if it was if it was there? Because to me, it saved my ass a couple of times, and it's also <laughs> a feature because you can deliberately sort of you know uh give all the knobs 
you know, a big whack, you know, to have things pitched all over the place and just noise and craziness and then just jump back. You know, it's a, it's a big moment if, if that happens. Yeah. It's pretty cool. You, you have that, that on great. the on the um the Bookler 200e system. There's a preset manager on that. Oh, would you tour with that though? No. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it, it does, it produces, you know, because it doesn't change how you've got something patched. It's just where all the buttons and knobs are. So it is kind of weird how you can have a, you can set up a patch and then save it and then just flick to a different preset. It's just like, yeah, it's, it's a good kind of randomizer thing, but hmm. um, yeah, I don't... the Pacific Voltage Club is mentioning the electron stuff, which of course has all that stuff uh, built in. So anything you do with it can be uh, stored, any, any scene or setting um, can yeah, be stored. Yeah. What is it like function on the machine drum? It's like function something and just boom, it goes back. I've never used it though live, believe it or not. Somehow. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I'm like, oh, why? Sometime I should probably. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if I had that, it's such a, it is such a great feature, especially for, um, especially for uh, a Euro rack would be amazing. But I think there's only so much. Um, maybe that the Beat Step Pro doesn't have anything like that, does it? Do I know Tony uses that? Do you use that Beat Step Pro? Does it have yeah. something to go back to whatever your sequence is if you tweak it? Or is it just the sequencer? Uh, you, really you collected the Beats the Pro, no? Uh, yeah, for, for, the, for the set we did, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I, yeah, but I I I basically just punched in stuff uh, on the fly. I never, I don't even know how to do presets on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. Yeah, I mean, you can pro you can program like sixteen, I don't know, drum patterns or whatever in it. But um, yeah, <laughs> programming is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there we go. Oh, okay, that's the answer. Sorry. Um, I don't have a panic button. I was planning to do this for years, and I still haven't implemented such a thing. Now you confirm that maybe I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't need it, man. Just no. go with it. <laughs> Improvise. Absolutely. Kick drum. <laughs> that's why I just <laughs> So let's see. We well, we're kind of ignoring the people in the comments, but uh, <laughs> try our best to um, to answer questions. Maybe um, uh, maybe now's the time. If you um, if if you have anything specific to ask to any of us or all of us, um, drop it because uh, uh, yeah, maybe we can um, maybe we can talk about your questions. Were we, were we talking about? Oh, I see. Oh, I see a cat on the way. <laughs> ah. <laughs> ah. A, commer a commercial break. <laughs> um, um, we, I think we, were, me and Colleen were talking about um, uh, what was it like? Changing your having a having a you know working with a particular. I mean, this is this is in the studio, not not so much live, maybe, but having a particular kind of method or uh, workflow or setup that you work with, and, and and about how important it is to uh, to change that and not just stick with the same thing and be aware that uh, you know. I know for me anyway, I I would I just start to get lazy about how I work and I keep going falling to the same. Uh, kind of uh, patterns about making tracks. So I like to completely change something about the workflow, the gear, the approach. So we were kind of talking about that. Yeah, I actually, and it's actually, Steve, you were saying almost the same thing that I've been doing is where I would normally just record, um, you know, everything out to just record all my tracks. Yeah, just press just start and, and you'll see yeah. what happens. Yeah. But then what I started doing recently, well, I just started doing it for this last track I'm working on, um, is, is separating the channels 
um, and doing different takes for different things, like doing yeah, yeah. one long bass line where everything, where you can, again, two hands, so you can't do everything at once. Okay, so, yeah. open up style. I do that nowadays yeah. as well, indeed. Yeah. And then so, maybe do a bass line and then do the rest live on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's what I, I do now. I started yeah. doing that all as well, and it's just like, uh, it's not. It's really hard actually to change the. You get so hardwired in your brain, you know, to to your process that, and it's yeah, it's tough to. You got to force yourself to do it to make grow to grow. But I'm in the moment of a production, awkward production transformation. <laughs> I can't think there'd be a word for it, but I don't know. <laughs> so and changing the flow which is not uh, ultimately is great and important, but it's, it's hard to, yeah, it's, that, it's to kind of that, that, that learning, learning the instrument again. Yeah. yeah. And learning what works and what doesn't work and trying something that doesn't work. is just as valuable. If you try something and it doesn't work, it's still worth doing because then, you know, okay, it doesn't work and I can move on and stop thinking about it. And no, it doesn't work fine. <laughs> you can move, leave it behind or learn and it helps you to learn what does work. So, so yeah, it's been, it's been really good and doing different approaches and, you know, talking to, you know, other people about how they're working. And it's really, uh, it's a really good time for communication between artists. That's, you know, Yakum, this, 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 this uh, thing, this knob twillers thing has really been really great. Like, on a just get emotional here for a minute, but it's been really great for <laughs> like I just love it of a therapy session. No, it's actually it's actually something that uh, I've heard more people say. Um, but I guess you know I started this because um, uh, the whole sort of social aspect of what we do is disappeared. You know. And uh, usually <clears throat> during the summer, we would have run into each other, each of you easily, you know, multiple times, whether it's on an airport or uh, in, you know, a car on the way to the gig or in a hotel, uh, or a hotel or lounge, or artist dinner, whatever. And then these conversations that we have now, or, or maybe a little bit less uh, planned, but um, they, they would take place and we would catch up, you know, and um, talk about music and gear and inspiration and whatever. Um, so yeah, it's this is just a place to continue doing that, I guess. Um, it's been like more, I felt like really more in touch um, with other artists now than I have mm. been. So, and it's like, um, you know, um, also strips the, the lockdown is kind of stripped back, like kind of a lot of bullshit about the industry and like people who really are passionate about the music and making music and, you know, the community of people, I think uh, it brings uh, people closer together when you kind of strip away all the business class or, you know, whatever, like airport lounge or all this stuff, it kind of strips back uh, and brings it more to a human sort of connection, reminds Absolutely. us that that's what it's all about, you know? So it's, it's been really positive in that way just the, the lockdown in general. And you have provided a really great place for a bunch of people to get together, including myself. So thank you. Nice one. <laughs> well, I'm happy you uh, you join, join us. And, um, Very, always. <laughs> awesome. Um, I saw something from um, our Belgian friends um, directed to Tony Surgeon. What setup do you use for your ambient stuff? I can imagine that's not the same as or is it as your techno sets? Uh, it is, yeah, it, it is different. Um, like like the techno set, it varies. Um, I, yeah, it's varied and changed. So, I mean, maybe, I, maybe, you, maybe explain what, why, what do you look for? in a setup if you do a more sort of sit down ambient kind of show and what is it different where does it differ from more poly less mono since or is that the thing or you do everything uh, with mono i like i mean i i like a really compact setup i like 
Mm. I, I love to have something that fits in like a hand luggage wheelie case. You know, that's <laughs> yeah, an yeah, ideal yeah, yeah. size because I, you know, I do sometimes check stuff in, but that's that's a yeah. bit of stress, you know. But then scary. carrying stuff on is a stress as well. So, <laughs> uh, um, but um, uh, I think current. Uh, well, I would say that there's always a looper involved in it. Whatever setup I've used, I've I've used uh, <clears throat> an electro harmonics uh, looper. Uh, it's like a four four channel looper. Um, it has like a clock in and a clock out, which is great to be able to clock if I'm if I'm like uh, playing something with an arpeggiator on it or, or or something like that. Then that lets me um, kind of cleanly play in arpeggiate arpeggiator loops into the looper, and that works really well. But um, I don't know. It's like I for ambient stuff, I try to have something that's a little bit noisy and alien and atonal and something something with a bit more of a melodic element. And it's like playing off. Um, it's like a rough and a smooth against a smooth uh, in that. So um, I uh, at the, for a while, I really enjoy using the the, uh, the Lyra eight. Um, which is a really versatile, weird uh, piece of gear that that um, you know always surprises me. And some people think it's like kind of insane to use that live because it's so um, unpredictable, um, unpredictable yeah. and stuff. But it, again, it's one of those things where if I if I don't try and fight it, it'll work great, you know. But I've just got to go go with the flow of it. And sometimes I use that alongside just one of those little, um, you know, the little boutique SH101 things, just because it's really small, um, just for like arpeggios and, and more kind of melodic stuff. But um, other times I, I can only just use the, the Lyra on its own. Um, but before I used to use the, the music easel, the Bookler music easel, and that was really good because I could clock the arpeggiator on that from the looper and um and that worked really well so um i guess it's just using just using a couple of bits of gear that are really that are really flexible and that i feel comfortable with and i know really well i think it's more about maybe it's more about my relationship with the gear than uh, than anything else really so you know it's for in terms of advising anyone about what gear to use for an ambient uh, improvised thing, then it's just something that's that you feel comfortable with and is really flexible. But a looper is 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 uh, the vital, the kind of central point to it. Is that your reset, your reset <laughs> button thing, the looper, or, or sort of the thing that can can save your ass? <laughs> if, if, well, it's, if, kind of, it's it's <laughs> like, it's like having a time machine where it's like ha this this four channel loop it's like having four of me i'll 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 set up a <laughs> i'll play into the loop and you can keep layering and layering and layering and you end up with a sound that you can't believe came from your gear because mm. it's just layered and layered and layered and then you just leave that playing and then you like start a new loop and um yeah that that really takes the kind of lifting work out of having to do everything all there in that moment <clears throat> so um yeah it's all about the looper mm -mm. <laughs> so you have a kind of like a, a collaborator or something that is is doing something for you rather than you having to do all yeah. the movements yourself yeah then but it's I, like i guess, it's I guess like with... pl playing with yourself then the... yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> Aha, ba -boom. oh my god <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of comments about the about the name. I was thinking maybe change it to uh, Rotary Encoders Twiddlers Hangout. <laughs> That's <laughs> but anyway, we, we've, got a, we've got a, an explicit thing on the, on the podcast, uh, so you know. <laughs> Where were we? Sorry. I'll leave it, I'll leave it up to your imagination. Uh, 
Yeah. So, so would you say the the um, it, it it doesn't really make a difference uh, other than uh, you have to kind of uh, you, you you can be more sort of um, free form when you do an ambient um, set. I mean, there yeah. doesn't necessarily need to be as much structure, I guess, as when you do something beat driven. Yeah, but I I think it's really to me it's vital to to somehow tell a story. Yeah. That, otherwise, it just becomes a collection of noises, you know. And I think that's a really important distinction for me with a with a uh, an ambient set is is it has to be has to kind of be a story and a, and a flow and, and, you know, dynamics and uh, light points and dark points and not, not just this random collection of, of noises. Cause, cause it can very easily be that and it, it needs to, it needs to draw myself and the audience along on, on some kind of some sort of journey, journey of sound. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It yeah. works well uh, with did, that answer, did that answer the question? <laughs> I, I don't know. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was about um, um, your life setup for ambient shows. Ah, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, um, yeah, for, first of all, I don't really like capturing things into genres too much. Uh, but yeah, okay, you know, we've got to sort of stick something, some, stick a name on it to know, you know, what kind of stuff we're talking about. But um um i think with i noticed even more the the last few um uh, weeks when 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 we were doing um uh, these collaborations on the stay on sound system it's so easy to go from one extreme to the other in almost an instant i mean you can with a very small setup you could you could theor in theory do a techno show an acid show and a and an ambient show or it, without any trouble because the um, yeah it's just a matter of what what you do with uh with with the sound sources i guess you can drown things in reverb and make things slow and evolving and then you know that sort of should pass for as ambient <laughs> very quickly yeah. you know uh, <laughs> so um but yeah uh, there's one machine that i've been using recently uh which is um which <clears throat> Could classify as a really nice ambient machine sort of like the lyra which is very much relying on performance it's the, the that um, resonant garden by oh, folk yeah. tech um it really doesn't do anything by itself you have to um it sort of relies on loopers as well a little bit it, there's there are, are three units in there which uh, have multiple effects uh um, one at a time, though, and if if you make one of them or multi, two of them a looper, um, you can get endless uh, things going on, uh, and um, yeah, really sort of make long, um, slowly evolving um, sounds. Um, and and the cool thing about it is it's it's also very um it's visually attractive because there are these strings pop sticking out of the of the top so people can see what you're doing or at least see your hand movement um uh, connect to a sound or how do you say it? correspond to a sound that yeah. they're hearing so it's um um it's a fun live instrument because it's, it's it's sort of you can tell that something's happening there you can sort of see how it's done and and that is um it's a fun way to um to do sort of droney stuff with that machine. Yeah, I've never, I, I, I haven't had a chance to kind of play with one in person. Mm. But it, yeah, it looks their their gear. Yeah, it has the same quite kind of. I don't know the same, but it has a similar kind of uh, unpredictability as the Lyra. So you know it's going to do something, but you never know exactly what it is going to do. <laughs> That's the exciting so, thing. It's going to yeah, do yeah, something. Absolutely. So and and it's also very slow. It's like uh, trying to um, to sail on a tanker. You know what I mean? It's it's like oh, right, you do yeah. something, and then only seconds, or sometimes even tens of seconds after your your movement, it's starting to uh, to show up in the in in oh. the sound. So wow. it's uh, depends on because the delays can be sort of endless and the reverbs are massive and long. <laughs> so not every movement is is sort of causes an instant change, you know. So it's um, uh, it's something to be careful careful with because you could drive something 
to the you know the limit or to the point of uh, feedback and getting out of control um but it yeah at the same time that makes it interesting it kind of makes you a little bit more careful with it i guess hmm. um but it's a really fun instrument to play with yeah somebody said i think they would sell their kidney for it on the track oh right <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's a very you good you know, in the garden <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a that's a testimonial if I ever heard one. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> Both kidneys, yeah. Well, it's not. I don't think it's that expensive. <laughs> but, uh, it's it's one of these machines that um, they'll just keep on giving you results. Uh, you know, every time you you set it up, it's uh, it's going to do something different and something very satisfying. So, it's um, I think it's worth it. So, uh, what time is it? Oh, okay, we have, we have some time. Um, so, Steve, are you going to do some live sets now? Yeah, we have to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're talking right now. <laughs> yeah, we're talking right now. No, but uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would, yeah, uh, I would love to <laughs> do something with the thing we did. Uh, as well somehow because yeah, like I, said, I don't want to do it alone yeah and, and and it works well with you so far so far so this this one time yeah <laughs> no no no, <laughs> no yeah no, sure i, I, I mean, mean yeah. I, I, I can't imagine it will completely go wrong another time i mean we we both have experience in the machines and things and you know yeah. to improvise and it was improvising and mm -hmm. that's basically what we have to do again i would say yeah and yeah, of course, exactly. that's exciting if it's ever going to be for me with, with public, because yeah, that's a new thing for me. Mm. So I guess it's going to be shaky hands and <laughs> twiddly knobs. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think um, I mean, the, both Colleen and, and Tony have, uh, have toured a lot with, with setups. Um, and all you, you keep saying that many of the choices you make for your setup are based on portability and uh, um, size and stuff like that. So um, I think the way we've done the live shows here at Store is just it's just impossible. That's just go, that's just not <laughs> to yeah that amount of gear would never uh, that would mean we have to hire a tour bus and. Uh, <laughs> In a roadie yeah, but, uh, yeah, but I guess a smaller mixer would be sufficient because yeah, then I'm not going to use twelve channels of drums anymore. Yeah. <laughs> because beside those channels, I had just I think one stereo channel and two mono channels. Yeah, uh, with synths. Yeah, and that's that's it. Yeah, I thought and, about it. Though. I mean, it's it's um, I I like I like the sort of old school way with a big desk, you know. And, and yeah, yeah, I love it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, how? How to make that portable is another thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they have smaller mixes they can rent or something or hire. Uh, yeah, as yeah, long maybe. as there's PFL on it, because that's an important <laughs> one. Yeah. But yeah, the oh, machines yeah. nowadays are small enough to easily put it in a carry-on. Yeah, like Tony at the boutiques and blah blah. I mean, yeah, I also have those. It's perfect yeah, for. I, the, I'm gonna get the like. My goal is almost there. I'm gonna get the um, the TR09, the little 909, Tony, that you had lent me <clears throat> the one time. Yeah. If I do that, then I've finally gotten my Eurorack to the point where I can only bring, where I can carry everything on board. I don't have to check anything. This is like a huge moment, mm -hmm. like a moment for me where I'm I don't not, have to worry I'm about not, it. I'm not 100% convinced about how it how it sounds. I mean, no. I really want it to sound great, but I don't oh, the really think it does. Good. Yeah, I don't know. What, the, I mean, the baby nine oh nine. You mean? What's that? You're talking about the the baby nine oh nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you if you use it to kind of augment over the if you're I don't know playing like percussion over the top of something, I think it can be okay. But if it's too much on its own, it, it's I don't know. I I don't I don't know what it is, but something about it just um. It's the same thing like with the, um, you know, trying out different Eurorack oscillators where at home yeah. it sounds great and you play it live and it's just like, it's just not there somehow. It's not, mm -hmm. 
But as well, yeah. if you would split up the the kick drum on one channel and I, all the others on the other channel, I don't I don't think you can. I don't think you you've got you don't have. Or maybe not live. You can. It. No, they don't. But yeah, that's just what I've been doing since I was young. I had a sampler with just stereo out. What did mm -hmm. I do? I sampled one on the left, one on the right. So I had yeah. at least two channels. And you can do this with the nine hundred nine as well. Ah, oh, yeah, you can panic. Stuff on, you? Yeah, yeah, you can panic and then mm. turn everything, maybe the kick on the left and everything else on the right. Ah, so did, because did, for me, it's you... always the kick. Yeah, it's going to be a snowed under if you so pile has, up has, the sound. Have you, have you tried it? And it, and it I and haven't it tried it uh, live yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but I was thinking, playing with the idea in my head if it would be possible. Maybe it's like some... It works some some gigs it can work okay and other gigs it can kind of let me down a bit it's a little mm. uh inconsistent i don't mm, know okay. i wouldn't what, i mean what did you think do you, you've i mean i've used it when we've played together colleen is it i think it sounds good because i wouldn't use the kick drum because i bring mm. actually i have the yo marks that m base 11 the little oh, kick yeah. drum module so that i would bring because i can also yes. fit. That's and very then good drum. yeah it's it doesn't i don't like it so much in the studio it's a bit much like when you're recording it but live it's like a fucking beast and it just destroys everything and it's bad so it's like it's amazing <laughs> live so i was going to use that and i feel like the mini 909 would be good because i just need tom drums yeah that's kind of basically all that i need is tom drums that's what i'm now carrying what I've been doing lately, I'm carrying the machine drum only for the purpose of the tom drums and the ride cymbal, which is a very heavy machine to carry for only those two purposes. I'm like, well, why don't I just get one of those? And because I used to use it as my leads, the main thing is my leads, and uh, I bet I just gone. I now have a sampler of my um, the Eric sample drum module, so. Now I moved away from what was that? Me. It, it was some. It sounded like scratching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it me? Is it this? That's something. Yeah. Oh, was that you, Steve? It could be because I was yeah. going off my yeah, head. It's, it's you. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just need Tom drums. <laughs> I just need Tom drums. <laughs> I think, I think the toms are pretty. Tom the, the toms are okay on it. So that's it's required and the Pretty. i even have modules for the uh the 909 hats so i don't even need it for the hats believe it or not yeah. but i think how do the open hats sound uh, i thought it sounded good when you were playing it okay uh, okay okay yeah. they don't have that like thick bitey yeah. thing yeah, that's true. okay the ride is sort of okay i think yeah. <laughs> Better than the, than the Hyatt, let's say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the ride and the tom drums are what I need. Yeah, the toms are really yeah. quite okay. Okay, good. Then sold. <laughs> so then I'll be able to carry everything on board, which makes me feel uh, very happy and relaxed. But I finally figured this all out, and then now there's no gigs to plane again. I, I got this, <laughs> this case that was specifically most... Uh, cases don't actually technically fit on an airplane if oh, they really yeah, want yeah. to you uh it happened to me one time where if you really are like stickler about putting <laughs> a thing it won't go and you're just screwed and they tried to make me check it and it was a nightmare and so now there's one case uh that i finally found that's there's nothing they can do to stop me from taking it on the plane <laughs> 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 so that was a huge, that was a big uh, anxiety reducer for me that I don't have to worry about that. Here's one for you, Colleen. Have you tried the the squid uh, sample? I think that's ALM, right? ALM BC squid. Ah, uh, yeah. Have you tried oh, that? No, I have not. If you want crunchy tongs, oh. it's a gold mine. Yeah, oh. that, that triggered my. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't tried it. Have you, Tony? No. Um... Writing it down. I, I, yeah, I have not been buying any gear this year okay, okay. For, <laughs> for certain, for certain, certain reasons. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. In a way, it's kind of it's kind of good because I've I've 
I've been like, okay, I've got to like just investigate more what I've got. But no, I have not tried the squid sample. And I, I'm trying to avoid looking at gear that I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> trying to stay away from that. Yeah, it's not a good time. <laughs> and actually, I'm sure it's good because that, yeah, the ALM stuff is all, you know, I really like the ideas and the design and, you know, there's, there's usually, you know, the fun, you know, the names are fun as well. So it's, it's good gear. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about the 909? I was, so, I saw somebody comment that the discussion always um, <laughs> ends up being about 909, but um, I don't know. The thing is, uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to be snobby about it, but the, the real 909 is there's, I haven't heard anything yet um a clone or or a replacement or uh, even the roland's um interpretations that sound the same as a real 909 you know there, there is just something about that machine that is um i don't know it's it has just enough control and just um enough limitation um and punch and a lot of power yeah yeah, That's the thing. it's really stench. You went all wistful there, Joachim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wistful, like what's that? Just thinking about the nine and nine. You, you kind of were <laughs> I'm getting emotional. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's it, it is it is it is a special piece of gear, though. It, it is. Yeah. 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 I don't know. It's um. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if if there would be um. This most simple setup, I would say, uh, for live show would be a real 909 and some mono synth, and and it'll it would sound incredibly powerful on almost every system. Um, you know, there's there's no um, uh, frequencies that hurt. You know, it sounds yeah. there's always a very coherent um, output, whatever you do with it, however you tune it. Um, you never you, you can't drive it over the edge or you can't make any mistakes with it and it's funky it's got this two-step uh, velocity and accent kind of programming way which makes it really driving and and yeah it's a bit I don't know it's just so, something spe special about it and um, um, it sounds filthy and, over a, a PA. Oh it? man, <laughs> yeah, just that and a, and a massive sound system and some warehouse reverb, you know, with you know the actual acoustics. That's just crazy. <laughs> yeah, when 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 Jeff Mills plays it, he doesn't even need a, a mono synth with it. He just yeah. does it all yeah. with that. It's like where how where how is he getting those like yeah. riffs out of it? It's... Yeah. Uh, you you were also a total hooked you're also totally hooked on the on the 909 right steve i mean you... yeah totally i mean my yeah. first ever machine was an 808 in 85 mm. 15 but yeah somehow the 909 attracts me more and i misused it a lot i guess over the years <laughs> and i still am yeah. <laughs> i can't help it it's it's yeah it's sort of my go-to machine always yeah. sometimes yeah, it's funny how you how you when we talked uh, when you when you were over here that you um, are very very specific about sounds. I never, I mean, I never really. Uh, not, not not like met, super picky, but yeah. No, but I mean, I I I never really met people or never. I mean, the you, you are definitely somebody who has a, a, an extra antenna for for sonics or for sound. You are very. Um, uh, particular about it yeah it, yeah it's it, it but some it sometimes it's also time based that after a certain year i don't remember these sounds okay but i had it a lot with people that used uh, like a, a tiny fragment of a track from the 80s or whatever and i'm like hey and they're like what the fuck? how do you hear it it's, it's just in me somehow and i can't I don't know what it is yeah, you, but you, it started when I was young already. When I was young, uh, I would hear records on the on, on pirate radio, and they had uh, DMXs, DXs, and uh, other drum machines, Lindrums. And while I never saw those machines when I was thirteen, then I knew which sound came from which machine. Mm. It's really strange. So just because I heard a few tracks a certain time, and then I was like, okay, this is that machine when I heard it. But I then for you... me, the bad thing is when I actually got the machine, when I got the DMX 
and I played the thing, and I was like, but where are the toms that I know are in there? And then I found out they had a separate chip cards that you could oh, put in, no. which contained. So I found a website and ordered all these sounds that I heard in my 80s records and have all these chips now that I can change oh, for these right. machines. I think you learn, you learn uh, there's something about, like maybe when you're a kid, that you, you learn how to listen. I don't, I don't know how else to kind of explain it, but... Mm. There's something. There's a. There's a certain way of listening, and paying really close attention to, like a record or sounds or something that that I don't think doesn't just doesn't just automatically happen. I think there are different ways of listening to the same mm. thing, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, if you like, it's like us being in a club listening to a record and the crowd listening to a record. We completely mm. listen with a different ear than the people on the dance floor. Sort of. Yeah, once you learn how how everything is put together and how different instruments work and yeah, where once where a sound stops in a in a mix and where it continue, you know where it's uh, where it's another sound or you know we we sort of can easily tell sounds apart because we are used to you know dealing with that in the studio I guess. I mean, uh, but if. It Sometimes we can't even listen to records normally anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah. With, with all the elements and trying to keep them apart or pick them apart. Uh -huh. are, are any of you any of you synesthetic? Like when when you when your brain connects um, di different senses and makes it sort of one, uh, like uh, sometimes. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> okay. Right now you are. Oh yeah, yeah, with the with the back <laughs> No, I think um, I, I do a lot. I do a lot with visualizing the the kind of cr yeah. It's like sound and sound and visual sense. Um. So I think I was talking but in to your head then, in your own head. Then. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not literally seeing the colors, man. But. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's def there's a lot of visualization involved in in music making mm. for me. I think I was talking to someone the other day about um like a like work like creating a rhythm and if I can visualize some kind of movement from that working with that rhythm then then I know it's the right a rhythm that's going to work. But there's a, definitely a visual element in that visualizing the movement that goes with the rhythm. So do you con consciously visualize things or is are are sounds just uh, uh instantly uh, recalling or uh, activating visuals in your in your mind in your brain Maybe it's a way of of realizing whether something works or not it's like can I can I visualize it like with a rhythm or I don't know it's quite it's it's quite difficult to explain but it's a mm. way of a way of realizing whether something works or not, and it, it works on some kind of visual level. You mean whether? Okay, you mean whether it's working together, like something which is it, there's contrast involved, or there's a, a pattern involved visually. And if 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 it doesn't look good to you in your sort of mind's eye, then you don't think yeah, it's going to work kind, sonically. Kind yeah. of. Yeah, there is right. there's some on some sort of visual level. There's I'm I'm checking. Uh, I'm checking it. Right. Know. Yeah, it works similar in my brain, but um, I actually uh, I can see and describe uh, what a sounds look like. What a sound mm -hmm. looks like. Mm -hmm. So, for example, going back to the nine and nine, a kicks the nine and nine kick has a, a certain shape and and form, not really a color, and um, it's true for every single instrument, but it's also true for any other sound. So when I, I when I hear a sound. Um, there is always uh, it's not a very clear image so i don't i you know i could sort of make a sketch of it but it wouldn't be the same um but it's there's always um i guess it's the same as how you describe it tony but um uh it's always it's always um visualizable if you know what i mean so i always, i can always check it in how it looks uh, I, it's not like they just come into my into my vision or into my sight or anything. Mm -hmm. But if I I don't even, I don't have to try either. If if I think of a sound or hear a sound, and and then there's this sort of 
uh, aiding thing in in my head or in my brain to uh, sort of estimate estimate uh, or sort of yeah I, I don't know how to deal to to deal with it or to sort of process it. It comes along with a visual. That's what it's, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it definitely sounds yeah. similar. But for me, it's yeah. definitely a way of it's somehow I would describe it as a way of checking what I'm mm. doing on this kind of visual level. I don't know. Okay. It's, it's... I've never used it as a tool though. <laughs> but it's, it's, I, all, I it's, it's, it's I like wasn't a... consciously doing it, but I, mm. I had a conversation with someone the other day and for the first time I realized that I kind of do that, but I hadn't, I hadn't ever thought of it in that way before until mm. just the other day. Right. Interesting. Hmm. Weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I. I. I mean. The, yeah. <laughs> I, I. I never realized that that it worked like that for me. Uh, I thought that was just a natural thing. You know, if you <laughs> if you hear something, you can sort of describe its its shape or its texture as well if visually. Um, I just thought that it was um, how everybody. But it, <laughs> but it was. Uh, to it particularly <laughs> works with 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 rhythms, and it's like, can I imagine? <clears throat> I'm. I, I kind of have to picture this kind of movement is like a visual picture of the movement of the rhythm. And if it, if it moves in this fluid way, then, then it works. Mm. I don't know. It's either work. I have to kind of picture something. Funny because <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. It's difficult to explain because I I'm just, it's, uh, I don't fully understand it. <laughs> the funny thing is because I'm listening to you guys, if I have it as well, but, the only thing that always, what about you, Colin? That always, <laughs> no, but the only thing do that you, always pops up is, is when I, for the first time, heard uh, Rhythm is Rhythm, the dance, which is actually a square bass used in it. But for me, that's always been the shape of a circle or a round thing or a hollow thing. And that, that always stuck with me. And always when I hear a square wave, it's, it's round for me or something hollow. In, in, I think that's the only a tube. visualization. I, yeah, like a tube. It sounds like a tube. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's the only visualization I get, I think, music-wise. It's never really, un unless it's like an unclear thing that I don't know about. But it's not something that I'm aware of then. Mm. At least not like you guys. Are. I also don't have that. Okay, right. <laughs> 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 so I, what so, other weird stuff do you yeah, do do you <laughs> I, I associate uh sounds like with the like a time and place or some kind of feeling yeah for me feeling kind of so everything's emotion. feeling yeah but you have a really strong visual aesthetic and and you really imagine very elaborate yeah. scenarios <laughs> scenarios so <laughs> yeah i have a like a visual sense and a totally different way in terms of like performance and fashion and uh dance and things so i think that my visual sense is very separate from my uh like uh sense of sound so it's mm -hmm. I wonder, that's interesting because I feel like maybe it can't be, uh, that's finely tuned in a different direction. Yeah. Do you I'm have, a, do, do you two, Colleen and, and Tony, have a, a certain way to explain things to each other that is unique for your collaboration, like in, in music or direction? <laughs> we have our own language. It's, it's usually, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. That, that's so upsetting. That means, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, that, okay. That's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We definitely we have, have a vocabulary. Uh, we do, yeah. <laughs> and like, ew means yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong is right. Upsetting is pleasing. A lot of. Uh, is right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm left handed, so maybe that has <laughs> Left is right to me. <laughs> okay so <laughs> no uh, let's let's um let's switch it to something uh to future things um anyone wants to plug anything anything they're working on or are maybe releasing or playing somewhere or is, is there anything people should know about 
Yeah, Grand I'm just trying to keep I'm this uh, <laughs> <laughs> clean, Tony. <laughs> oh, no, no. The future. <laughs> yeah, the future is very uncertain. Yeah. yeah well, you, you, you might have something uh, uh, ready for release or, you know, a thing you're doing. I don't know. I have two tracks coming on. Uh, oh, oh, God. Okay. Uh, thank you for saving me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have some foreseeable future. Okay. Uh, so I have two tracks um, on a compilation, uh, two different compilations coming out. Um, I'm doing a remix that I can't really talk about right now. Those things are occurring. So look out in yeah. September or October. Nice. So, oh, I guess I do to... I do have stuff coming, but like like the same with Colleen, I'm not I'm not actually God, able. God. I'm not actually you know, it's like in that stage where it's like pre announcement. Yeah, thing. exactly. But okay. I just yeah, wanted there, to be I just wanted um, to be polite and give you the opportunity. Yeah. No, there there's a there's a new twelve there's a new twelve inch coming uh that I'm that I'm that I'm pretty yeah, I'm happy about and uh and there's at least another remix that's not kind of come out and been announced yet. Um, but, um, yeah, but I, I've just, I've really enjoyed um, kind of doing a lot more um, syncopated rhythm stuff and a little bit more kind of thinking a bit more about melody and things like that and not just trying to like just crush people. <laughs> um because you know i just feel like i want to i want to make music with some kind of a sense of hope in it instead of just trying to destroy people because uh <laughs> i don't know it's just I to me it's just re a reflection of of you know uh, i think me and colleen talked about this how you know you can have this music of this kind of dystopian music but do you? Re do, I don't want to hear do dystopian need, do music. Do we need more of that? No, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to hear dystopian music when yeah. we're living in a dystopian. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, want, I want something that's that that takes me somewhere else than than where we're at in the world. So you know, I've been trying to consciously make uh, some techno that that has some more kind of hope and optimism in it. Mm. That's a great it's thought. Funny. It's funny because I have this funny experience with a track of yours. I forgot which album, uh, Tony, and I really love that track. And when I played it to my former girlfriend, she thought it was really creepy and dark. <laughs> she couldn't <laughs> handle it. And then that was the moment that I was thinking like, okay, it's it's really different how people receive music. Yeah, yeah. Because I really love that track. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to me, that was a, a strange, strange to hear that she said thought it was really dark and creepy and i was like oh but it's beautiful <laughs> yeah yeah so it's, it's really so. about the receiver <laughs> yeah 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 i guess that's the second life of uh of a track when you the intention that you made something with doesn't always necessarily come across to the listener there's always you know, the second life of a track is when it leaves the studio, when it becomes public domain, I guess, and it takes off all kinds, takes on all kinds of different incarnations and memories attached from people. And, you know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, I guess it's the beauty of instrumental or music in general, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's, um, when it's more abstract, it's open to, to uh, <laughs> all kinds of interpretations. Yeah. 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 Was, exactly. Yeah. Uh, one uh, last question, I guess, from Marcus. What's up, Marcus? Um, he wants to know when all that stuff is coming out, which which you played in the um, photon set. Yeah, Steve. it's a good question. I mean, I'm I'm in the since the whole Corona, I'm in the phase of finishing off stuff, but then of course also a lot of remixes can come in, and since it's the only uh, income I can can make, <laughs> so I do some of take some of them. So, but that sets me back, of course. And actually, if I think about the only thing that's coming now is a project that I've done. It's sort of a mini album for a writer of the, uh, he, he wrote a book called The Outlaw Ocean. His name is Ian Urbina, and he's a writer for, uh, a journalist for uh, New York Times. 
and he wrote a book about the sea and it's all the bad stuff on sea that's happening like piracy uh, human trafficking illegal uh, oil drilling and he approached about 200 artists to uh, to, uh, to contribute music to that book and, and to a certain uh, paragraph of the book and yeah it's, it's of course very serious so it became a very emotional sort of mini album with a lot of slow tracks and I try to keep a line in it to keep everything sort of electro-ish and using mostly the same drum machine that you have a certain line in it but it's completely not what people would expect uh, nowadays I think uh, in the photon track in the photon I played one of them I think it might be the second one that I played that's one of that album and yeah the rest of the stuff uh, some of them are going to certain labels and some of them I still have to finish and some of them were really like tryouts that I quickly bounced out of Ableton just to see how they sounded live but uh, yeah conclusion there's still a lot of work to do <laughs> I need a lot of lot of stuff that I need to finish you, you so, said uh, you said uh, it's not what people expect but I think that's the thing uh, one of the positive things about this time um, even though there are a lot of terrible things, you know, but uh, it's kind of kind of um, gave everybody a blank slate, you know, yeah. or not a, not really that. I don't, maybe that's phrased wrong, but I mean, this this is a, this time is an opportunity to do things that you shelved for a long time because of yeah, yeah. things being really busy or um, hectic, or whatever. And um, since there, you know, some of the music we do is actually functional music. You know, yeah, for, yeah, pe exactly. for people in, in to enjoy it, like with loads of other people in one massive room, or um, hear it on a on a big sound system. And now this necessity is sort of fallen away. For now, um, it's it's totally open what what you can what you can do. So you yeah. can do an experiment with lots of things that um, that have been postponed or even um, um, you know unfinished or yeah. shelved yeah, for, was... for a while. Yeah, because I didn't do musical stuff for a long time, very melodic mm -hmm. and very with a lot of feeling. And yeah, in in that project, since the on the the subject was so serious about what's happening on the sea, you sort of had to go deep and melodic. Uh, at least that was my feeling when I read this book. Cool. Looking forward to that. Um. I think that's a nice note to end on, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it was <laughs> great catching up again, guys. Uh, yeah. Nice to see you guys. Absolutely. And uh, oh, thanks to okay. the people who are well. watching on, uh, on YouTube, I'm going to do one additional shout out, and that's to uh, encourage people to, uh, to join our Discord community. That's uh, a server we set up where can this the conversation we're having now kind of continues with uh, I think in mean the meantime it's about 700 people um, and uh, it's becoming a really fun place to uh, to connect with us and to uh, talk about uh, music and gear and inspiration and ideas and stuff um, so that and uh, we also recently started a patreon if people like what we do and then um, I encourage you to check that out too so Thanks again, everybody, and uh, thanks for people in the live chat who contribute to the conversation, and uh, see you next time. Bye. Good ciao, ciao. Fun, guys. Bye. Yeah. Ciao. 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 <laughs>